So here we go, precise as ever. It's noon, and as scheduled, we're um, starting with the final four block of the Tukvenitz International Health Tourism Conference. In part four, we will talk about promotion and communication in health tourism in general. We had great introduction by our speakers throughout the, the panels. Uh, we had Christina uh, in the, the last block. So we, we get some introduction to what it is all about in promotion and communication in health tourism. So we will have um, four speakers in this block. Um, we will present every single one of them. So with Medical Tourism Manager of Visit Berlin, Michaela Keder will be the first one. We have Pri Vice President of H. Isaac, Salva Rafi, uh, Google Certified Trainer at Escape uh, Limited, Mr. Miroslav Varga, and Medical Travel Expert, Influencer and Opinion Leader, Mr. Ilan Geva. Later on in um, the questions and answers session, uh, Ms. Isabella Vertar, Editor-in-Chief of the Sensa Magazine here in Croatia, will join us as well. So let's go to the uh, first presentation of the fourth block. So Michaela uh, Kerer, the Medical Tourism Manager of Visit Berlin, will tell us on treating patients from abroad, Berlin as a medical destination. So let's enjoy the presentation. A very warm welcome from the German capital city, Berlin. A big thank you to the organizers and thank you for inviting me to speak. It is my pleasure to participate in the eighth CIHT conference. Let me quickly jump back in history, as in this year we are celebrating 30 years of German re reunification. The picture of Berlin's Brandenburg Gate here after the German Democratic Republic built a notorious wall in 1961, in my view best symbolizes what Berlin achieved within the last years. It changed from walled city into a walled city. Today known for its history, creativity and value for money, it became the city of freedom. In 2019, welcoming 14 million tourists who stayed for 34.1 million overnights in Berlin. Three years after the unification of 1990, Visit Berlin was founded as the city's official destination marketing organization and has accompanied the tourism development since then. Let me quickly highlight the role of Visit Berlin. It is responsible for the city's touristic marketing nationally and internationally, presenting the city as a tourism destination as well as a congress and or a medical destination. As the numbers of tourists have sharply risen within the last years, we just started to turn from GMO, a destination marketing organization, to a DMMO, a destination marketing and management organization trying to mitigate over-tourism and decentralized tourism by integrating the Berlin suburbs in the touristic itinerary. Medical tourism in this context was part of our efforts to push so-called quality tourism instead of only pushing quantity in tourism. Needless to say, from March this year, nobody was talking about over-tourism anymore. However, Berlin as a medical destination was and is still attractive. I may even say that medical tourism showed a certain resilience so far as compared to other tourism segments. Definitely the number of patients from abroad dropped sharply. However, still some patients found their way to the Berlin hospitals under, of course, much tougher conditions. Let me give you some background information on how medical tourism developed in Berlin. Between 2001 and 2006, hospitals like Vivantes, Charité and the German Heart Center started to establish an international office to cater to the specific needs of patients from abroad. Back then it was an operational necessity. More and more patients from abroad knocked at the hospital's doors and needed to be taken care of, from language support to administrative procedures to cost control and final billing. All was handled differently as compared to the German patient. I'm emphasizing this point because medical tourism to Berlin was and still is very much demand driven, which means the hospitals didn't start to market and attract the patients, but they had to react to a market demand to be able to handle the different in-house processes. This is 
definitely different to many other medical destinations in the world. This fact explains why international marketing, the medical service, came into the picture much later. It was back in 2010 that Visit Berlin realized the importance of this market segment and started to engage in promoting health and medical tourism, cooperating with several medical providers in town. In 2015, it was estimated that under normal circumstances, of course, around 21,000 international patients per year travel to Berlin for medical treatment, inpatient and outpatient. In general, we don't have any complete or verified statistics about international patients in Berlin, simply because there is no institution that collects such figures. However, with close partners of our network, we've been able to set up a statistics group that we follow up every year. And last year we saw a 14.7 14 increase of international medical travelers as compared to 2018. 39% of them came from Russia, 9% from Ukraine and 12% from GCC countries. In 2016, Visible intensified its efforts together with several partners in Berlin and amongst other activities, launched a multilingual website, berlinhealthexcellence.com. In January 2020, we realigned our efforts again and established the initiative Berlin Health Excellence, where from now on 11 partners are funding selected marketing activities, while Visit Berlin supports with destination marketing expertise and logistics. Here you can see some of our USPs and why patients are coming to Berlin for medical treatment. We have all over more than 90 hospitals with roughly 20, 22,000 beds in Berlin. They provide the patients with a complete spectrum of medical care. Complex treatments and surgeries are performed using highly specialized and state-of-the-art medical equipment. Berlin's hospitals offer prevention, diagnostics, treatment, follow-up care and rehabilitation and therefore accompany a patient's journey from A to Z. With Charité, we have Europe's largest university hospital. Vivantes is Germany's largest state-owned hospital group. And the German Heart Center, Deutsches Herzzentrum Berlin, offers the biggest artificial heart program worldwide. Here are listed our 11 close partners of the Health Excellence Initiative. Currently, we have seven medical partners and four accommodation partners in our marketing network. Now, let me outline our general objectives in medical tourism at Visit Berlin. First, we are continuously active in extending our network of partners that include Berlin's medical providers, the hotel sector, as well as the trade and tourism sector. In addition to our 11 initiative partners, for example, we have currently 40 advertising partners on our website. Second, together with our local uh, business partner, Berlin, Berlin partner, they are the business developers here in Berlin. We are strengthening the medical providers by offering seminars in quality control, educate in legal aspects, in intercultural sensibilities and how to successfully run an international office. Third, and again, under normal circumstances, we are active in internationally marketing Berlin as a medical destination. For example, by attending medical tourism fairs and conducting events in the GIS, GCC region, as well as in China. Due to, to the Corona pandemic, of course, in 2020, we had to push, put most of our marketing activities on hold. Fourth and last, we are aiming to increase our visibility and in the same time accessibility. As I already mentioned, one of our biggest efforts was to get our website berlinhealthexcellence.com online, where patients from abroad can find comprehensive information about medical treatment possibilities in Berlin and can directly contact the Berlin hospitals without any intermediate facilitator. Here I gave you some features of our website. Right now we have more than 35 medical facilities listed. We have 94 chief physicians and specialists, 29 medical departments and 
27 accommodations. The website is given in, is set up in five languages, German, English, Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. And most probably in November this year, we will have additional information on our website to arrange a video consultation with one of our Berlin specialists and also to receive a second medical opinion. As I already indicated, Corona had made us pause many of our marketing activities. However, we conducted several online seminars, some with the support of the German National Tourist Office, informing media and travel agencies in selected markets about the current situation in Berlin, the upcoming highlights and the medical services. We also reached out to our hospital partners and investigated about their preparedness in offering video consultations for international patients. It turned out that many of them have been already technically, technically equipped, which is why, as I indicated in November, we extend our website with telemedical services, such as video consultation, doctor to doctor calls and second opinion. In order to push this service, we scheduled already a marketing campaign on the Arabic, Russian and English website of Deutsche Welle dw.com, which is the kind of German BBC. Yes, as I mentioned before, medical tourism to Berlin is very much demand driven and sometimes even has the character of an occasional business. A hospital's revenue only to a very small percentage relies on the international business. Many employees in the international offices for the time being are currently joining the pandemic pandemic team in their hospital to then hopefully soon switch back to the international business again when the pandemic is eased. Even when it is difficult to travel these days and somehow new walls are erected between continents and nations and there is even restricted movement within the cities. Visit Berlin is trying to be visible and also supports the virtual accessibility to the medical destination Berlin. Please, all of you stay healthy and hopefully see you soon in Berlin. Thank you very much. We're thankful to Michaela for an interesting case presentation. So you can see examples of some of the most developed uh, health tourism markets in the world struggling in the COVID era and what are their efforts, what were their plans. They must uh, certainly will have continuous programs and developments once the crisis is over or at least once that uh, the circumstances allow the further development of the business activities. And we continue with the second presentation of the day. And uh, it will be provided by Ms. Salva Rafi, Vice President of the HISEC, a healthcare cybersecurity and privacy challenges in medical tourism. Let's listen Morning, to it. Good morning, good afternoon to all of you. I'm Salwa Rafi, VP of Global Development with HISEC. Welcome to our session today. We're going to talk about the current trends of healthcare security, medical tourism, and the impact on patient privacy and safety. But first, let me introduce who we are. Uh, HISAC is a global member-based organization working with the health sector to share security threat and vulnerability information specially curated for the industry. Our mission is uh, to enable a trusted community in global healthcare and life sciences by being proactive to prevent cyber attacks, detect malware accurately, and manage response for both cyber uh, and physical security uh, events. 2020 will always be a first of a kind year for all of us to live through this pandemic. Governments are reporting a quadruple increase in cyber crimes since March, and the attacks are mainly targeting the health sector. The virus is changing security and how we are dealing with technology. Uh, this is how we make decisions uh, in our everyday life. And phishing is, as we see, phishing is number one cause of uh, breaches. Workplace violence is spiking, especially against uh, medical staff at hospitals. And medical research has become the most valuable data for, for all of us. As we see the increase of telehealth adoption, which is a great tool for access and delivery of health services, 
it still comes with many implications on device security and privacy regulations. The mandate to encrypt sensitive data and authenticate users is more critical now than ever. Another emerging trend in healthcare that has started a few years ago is medical tourism, which is expected to continue to grow as people travel to seek less expensive options for their medical procedures. And it involves a wide cycle of stakeholders with the patient or the medical tourist um, sits there in the middle surrounded by physicians, brokers, marketing campaigns, insurance and the travel industry. The most common procedure would typically be uh, dental care, cosmetic surgery, uh, elective procedures and fertility treatment. And the table here highlights the huge difference in prices among countries uh, for a hard bypass uh, procedure as an example. As we see, it's ranging from over $100,000 in the United States to only $3,000 in Mexico and $7,000 in Poland. So we should be vigilant to monitor the trends and associated risks of medical tourism because we see big variations in the quality of clinical outcomes, which are heavily dependent on local practices, hygiene measures, and KPIs in each country. Also, the mobile patients can initiate endemic infections through the spread of cross-border pathogens. Accreditation measures are inconsistent among states, and our particular concern is for patient privacy and the flow of sensitive data across borders to ensure the continuity of care, which is not always possible due to privacy regulations such as GDPR, HIPAA, or the typical interoperability issues between different IT systems. So let's talk about what we can do, the industry, as a critical sector. The mission of the ISACs is to form trusted and resilient communities in the face of organized, sophisticated, and sometimes state-funded hackers and bad actors. This is why we need to stand together and protect our data. When you join HISAC, you will have over 4,000 uh, analysts added to your team, working with you and for you, to help you build your strategy and share experiences and best practices when you need them. Our members are great companies to associate with. We have the top 50 global mid-device uh, manufacturers, top pharma organizations, and largest public health uh, systems in the entire world. And this is our membership mix this year. The largest portion is the health delivery organizations, which is the green part of the pie here, from small dental clinics to the largest multi-campus hospitals, followed by insurance companies, med device manufacturers, pharma, biotech companies, health IT organizations, building apps and solutions for the industry. We also have the R&D and university hospitals and large pharmacies. Uh, this is a, a picture of our SOC, the Security Operational Center of HISAC. We have dedicated staff of subject matter experts and security professionals who will work with you, your teams, to provide curated intelligence uh, for your industry. We have a member-centric model. Uh, as you see in the data flow chart here, multiple sources of credible feeds from government agencies, regulatory bodies, law enforcement, and many global intel agencies. Our members collaborate and share what they see in their own environments and countries. And we have a wide network of security vendors and partners. All of this information gets shared with our members and many use automated feeds to integrate with their own security SIMs uh, for the forensic analysis. This is the benefits and the value of information that we share with our, pay with our members every single day, focusing on both cyber and physical security, improved security posture, uh, natural disasters, geopolitical landscape. We crowdsource cybersecurity expertise. And we talk about the guidance and the new regulations for medical devices with the uh, largest regulatory authorities. We talk about the risks of emerging technologies. And the, the aim here is to build a community of trust 
and resilience as we share best practices. Uh, this is a, a few samples of the reports that we share with our members, the daily cyber headlines, cyber threat level, we use the traffic light protocol, physical security threat intelligence. We have a call that is uh, widely attended by all of the members, the threat landscape briefing. And of course, we share physical security and legal and regulatory updates. We offer surveillance of the dark web customized for your own domains, for the, for the members, to detect any compromised credentials, their users, patients, or any sensitive medical data, counterfeited drugs or medical devices, or any underground criminal activities related to their organizations. Cyware is a mobile platform that provides access of all of these capabilities to our members to send real-time alerts of any crisis or cyber incidents in their organizations. Uh, these come to their uh, well integrated with the smartphones, iPads, or laptops with great capabilities to filter and uh, do customized settings. Shared Services is our digital marketplace where we partner with world-class security vendors to provide software, products, services, and tools to our members at very special rates. And we are very active. We have numerous committees, councils, and working groups that all the members contribute. They are proactive in joining uh, and discussing all of the issues. We also are big on thought leadership and we publish white papers, articles, blogs, uh, and we welcome lots of collaboration with the, with the industry members. We are also very active. We keep a busy calendar of workshops, working groups, white papers, um, and we have the annual summits. We have the European uh, Council of Leadership uh, Membership uh, and Companies in Europe and the MedDevice Council. So uh, when with the membership, it comes equal seats at the table for all the members, no matter how the size of the organization, everybody has the same licenses and the same access uh, to all of the events. And let's watch a one minute video to summarize how each Isaac can help. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time uh, today. Please feel free to reach out. I'm uh, on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, and please reach out to us. We can help. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Ms. Rafi. We're back uh, in studio. And um, the thrill of this uh, conference uh, in these two days is because we have people presenting live. So the next speaker today that will present the presentation is here in studio with me. So good day, Mr. Varga, and uh, heartily welcome <laughs> to our Tsikpenitz International Health Tourism Conference studio. Um, your presentation is also a very interesting one. It tells us how did COVID-19 affect digital behavior? So M Mr. Miroslav Varga, Google Certified Trainer at Escape Limited. 
Uh, hello to everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be a part of this conference. Uh, when I uh, got the invitation, I was asking the, the or organizers, okay, but, but how will you organize such a conference? And actually, it's, it's uh, surprising how smoothly, how, how everything is going on very nicely. So thank you to the organizers and, and thank you to all the technical staff here. Uh, because I'm uh, live here, uh, I would ask you not to be very uh, judgmental. Uh, maybe some mistakes will <laughs> happen, but uh, the, the most important thing is the data is accurate. And I will share some data with you. First of all, uh, we live in a, in a world where our mobile devices are not anymore uh, exclusively used for communication. They are used for everything, actually. For translating, for checking the time, for uh, some information, for the weather forecast, for whatever we can, even, even uh, for some uh, maintenance of our homes and, and uh, other stuff in our, in our flats or apartments or homes. Uh, that are connected to the internet, we are using our mobile phones actually for everything. And uh, that is the first big change uh, that, is, uh, that has <coughs> happened to us. The second uh, change, because we always have our mobile devices with us, we became more demanding, more impatient, more curious. We want everything now, everything uh, 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 is in our uh, hands reach, uh, and because of that, we are even more using our devices to find out whatever, uh, the address, the directions, the temperature, sometimes even useless information uh, uh, in a sense that uh, they don't improve our current state, but we are just curious, uh, why is this street called uh, by, by the name of Napoleon, who was Napoleon and whatever. We use our device everywhere for everything. And uh, when you check the online behavior, something very significantly happened. Uh, we, we became uh, people or consumers or clients, whatever, that are seeking only for the best. Nothing is good enough only if it's the best uh, for us. So, for example, uh, the, uh, the search for best travel pillows exploded. It's, it's uh, raised three times in the last two years. If you check uh, even, even kitchen salt, even people searching for kitchen salt, uh, this uh, search query increased for four times in the last two years. So whatever we buy, we buy only the best stuff. And uh, overall, uh, the search for something that is best increased uh, about 100%. We are buying, we are looking, we are interested in only stuff that is the best, the best for us. But uh, there is a pitfall. Uh, we are always looking for the best, and therefore we are using the internet more than we are sleeping during the day. Uh, uh, some researchers uh, uh, even have uh, found out that we are online as double as we sleep. Uh, it can become a problem. It's, it's for some future, future um, uh, uh, solve, uh, solving, uh, problem solving. Uh, stuff, but it is a process going on and it is unstoppable. People are online all the time, everywhere, uh, for everything. Uh, and that's actually the paradox. People are connected and it's very hard for us, for everyone in all the industries, to connect with people. Uh, uh, because uh, the number of channels, the, the number of information, the, the ability to see anything uh, that you're interested in is so big that we are distracted everywhere and all the time. Um, uh, when I was a young boy, uh, I remember when my father bought the first uh, color TV, uh, all the people uh, in the street came to see this wonder of technique, uh, to see what is going uh, really, really colors on a, on a uh, uh, screen and it, it was it was a surprise uh, for everyone uh, and I remember we had one TV set and about 50 people in the room watching uh, a football game or watching watching some interesting uh, stuff that was going on uh, today things are completely changed scarce uh, 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 reach was scarce and attention was plentiful and now reach and attention completely changed the position. We have now reach to everyone, but we cannot get enough attention to our, our product. And even, even what is uh, more surprising, uh, borders, national borders are not 
uh, important anymore. Uh, at least uh, in Europe, this process is going uh, in, a, in a very interesting direction. 60% uh, of people in Italy and Spain, they, they don't even care uh, if something is uh, across the border. 80% of the Scandinavians. Uh, 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 people everywhere in the world expect everything on the net is viable wherever you are. And uh, this process is going on. Uh, th there is a significant change in behavior, a significant change in demand, and a lot of um, especially medical uh, tourism facilities are trying to catch up because uh, now the first contact is usually online. Uh, you can you can and you have, uh, there, there was an explosion of these online uh, services like Zoom, like Hangout, uh, uh, Google Meet actually, and others because people have the first contact and want to see a person, not a robot, answering questions. And because of that, a lot of um, online communication has been established uh, that uh, in a way um, supplemented the, the uh, physical behavior. And the COVID just added some additional uh, accelerators to this process. What has happened? Uh, um, people were, of course, interested in buying only the best. But now it's not only the best. It's, uh, it's asking companies, uh, clinics, or whoever they want to do any, any, uh, any interaction, uh, what can you do for me? How can you help me to overcome this uh, strange situation? Uh, what is your uh, attitude towards my problems? That was always there, but now it's much more um, uh, emphasized. Uh, uh, much more people expect companies, clinics, and everybody from uh, offering services or products. Uh, uh, the answer, okay, but what can you do just for me? Not for the general public, not for all the buyers, but just for me. And the second very interesting uh, thing COVID has added to, to our uh, behavior changes uh, is what is your brand doing to uh, help overcome these situations? What are the efforts of your company to help us all? And that was a, a very interesting uh, change of, of attitude. Uh, it's now not only uh, uh, what can you do for me, but what, uh, has your, uh, what has your company done for everybody else? Uh, how can you uh, uh, contribute to this uh, fight against the virus, against uh, whatever is uh, the new normality, so-called? How is your company contributing to overcome these strange new obstacles? And uh, uh, there is a there is a change in attitude. Uh, a lot of marketing campaigns, a lot of marketing uh, uh, professionals uh, were educated on the so-called FOMO process, fear of missing out. Uh, if, you, if you put some fear uh, in, in people's, uh, in your offer, uh, then people's behavior usually is pushed a little bit stronger to the, to the conversion, to the, to the uh, last step in the process. Uh, now, FOMO is not uh, anymore the main reason, it's fall, FOLE. It means fall of losing everything. Okay, if I, if I have some interaction with you, uh, uh, how can you guarantee me I will not lose everything? For, uh, for example, I, I buy an airplane ticket and I want to have a guarantee that I can cancel the flight uh, uh, the last day. If I cannot cancel the flight, I will not use your product. And a lot of uh, companies have to adjust for this new, new type of behavior. It's not anymore the fear of missing out, it's the fear of losing everything. I pay you something and I will never get the product. I cannot use it. I cannot uh, uh, go outside my, my apartment and uh, maybe some problems will be generated by this and I will lose everything that I have paid. And that is one of the main, main uh, um, behavioral uh, uh, one of the main behavioral change in, in people's attitude, in, in consumers' minds. Uh, don't uh, uh, give me some guarantee, I will not lose everything if I have anything to do with you. Uh, why, why this change happened? Uh, if you check uh, some data uh, provided by Google, it is obvious that the um, uh, coronavirus and, and COVID disease uh, is on an all-time high. Uh, never in history 
happened uh, so many search queries concerning uh, coronavirus or COVID disease. As you can see, it, it, it happened in, in the second half of March this year, where uh, the search queries uh, connected with coronavirus uh, uh, exploded. Exploded because never before uh, people searched for coronavirus, then it exploded, and now we are, we are getting back to a normal, new normal behavior. It's not so interesting anymore. Uh, the second interesting thing is that health uh, in general, so health as a topic, is on a five years high. Uh, uh, health was never so much Googled, so much searched on the internet as it has been this year. Uh, uh, this can be a good input for everybody in the health uh, industry because people are interested in, people are showing great interest to, to things connected to health in general, especially, especially with corona uh, connected, but uh, health in general has a high uh, demand in, in uh, people's uh, search behavior. Uh, for example, we, had, we, had, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, clients uh, that are offering in Italy uh, some dental services. And if you, if you check uh, the, the uh, period between March and April, there was an uh, old, almost uh, all-time uh, low uh, in demanding, uh, the search, uh, in searching in Italy for the search term impianti dentali. Uh, but uh, it uh, bounced back, just, just like uh, nothing happened. It bounced back, and, and it's, it's, uh, if, if you check the... the the lines, uh, if you check the, the, the results, it's almost like nothing happened. April and May, uh, 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 March and April, if you, if you uh, neglect this data, it's almost completely like it, uh, Corona never happened before. Very interesting for, for people in the health industry is, uh, we, we call it in our company, the active and the passive uh, offering of health services. What is an active uh, offering? For example, you have an uh, um, you have some, some surgery uh, or you have some dental services. Somebody is actually doing something on your body in your, uh, uh, with you. And there is this passive uh, health uh, uh, offerings. It's just uh, a run away from, from your, uh, um, uh, your um, uh, living place because something uh, is bothering your, your, uh, you with uh, allergies. You just change the, the place where you are living and uh, you will solve some of your health problems like allergies, bronchitis and some other uh, things. Uh, some people should avoid uh, uh, strong suns uh, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, when you check uh, this uh, possibility of passive health uh, offerings, uh, uh, this is uh, the data for Germany. Uh, in the, uh, uh, since 2004, the last 17 years, Germans uh, have a, uh, a very similar behavior concerning diet. Uh, because on, on December, nobody cares about diet. And in January, there is a great demand of uh, searching for diets. And this year happened, happened something very interesting. In March and April, nobody cared about diet. But now it's bouncing back. So uh, people are uh, getting used to this new normal situation. And uh, whatever happened uh, before the corona crisis is uh, uh, slowly uh, entering in our lives again. We are, we are used to this corona uh, changes and have learned in a way to live with them. A very interesting thing is, uh, uh, I mentioned already, bronchitis. If you, if you check, uh, all, it's also for Germany. In the last 17 years, in February, there is a great uh, uh, demand for, uh, in Germany uh, for anything connected with bronchitis. There is an explosion of, of uh, bronchitis uh, problems in Germany. And sometimes the solution is just to change your uh, living place, uh, go somewhere for 15 days or uh, two, three weeks, uh, change just your address and uh, your problems will be solved. And because of that, uh, 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 we had a nice uh, uh, analysis. I will show you the results. Uh, but just to show you, uh, this is uh, bronchitis is very interesting. In February, allergies uh, are, has all, have also a uh, seasonal peak in Germany. This seasonal peak is happening uh, uh, always in March. Uh, uh, in March this year, 
the seasonal peak was a little bit less than uh, the years before, but uh, as you can see, it happened also again. So uh, Corona didn't change us completely. It just changed or postponed some changes uh, that we uh, have, uh, some behavior that we have in our lives. We just postponed some things for a week or month or a quarter, but uh, uh, in the essence, nothing happened so radically. And uh, well, also, also the the, uh, the search for diabetes type two, uh, it has a nice, uh, nice steady growing, uh, um, uh, growing search query increase. Uh, people are interested because the disease is in, uh, increasing. It's also data for Germany, and if you if you check, uh, you can check every country in Europe. It's almost the same. Uh, this this line goes the same, uh, more, more or less up and downs, but it shows a steady increase in, in uh, searches. Uh, what have we done with the Quarner cluster? A very interesting, uh, um, uh, very interesting uh, usage of Google's data uh, provided by Google's consumer survey. Uh, Google's consumer survey is just a questionnaire. Uh, when you enter a, a website, you, you get one question that is paid uh, 10 euro cents, uh, and it's a, it's a uh, uh, price for an answer uh, that concerns yes or no answers. And we just asked people in Germany, uh, did you know that on the island of Maliloshin, people don't have bronchitis? And it was a very interesting uh, question because uh, 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 what happened after that question? People in Germany started to search Mali Loshin bronchitis. That was very interesting. And people in some, uh, we, are, we have there some hotels uh, as our partners uh, uh, told us uh, the increase of uh, uh, phone calls and emails and, and, and uh, inquiries during February when, when this. Uh, survey was going on was surprisingly high for them because people were searching about maliloshin bronchitis, that's their problem. Uh, um, and the answer was, okay, uh, we have a nice uh, uh, accommodation for you if you plan to come to maliloshin, whatever, if you have problems with bronchitis and so on. And, but what was for us very surprising, about 12% of German, uh, Germans uh, that participated in this uh, survey actually said, yes, I know about Maliloshin and I know there is no uh, problems with bronchitis. 12% uh, of Germans is much higher than the percentage of bronchitis uh, uh, affected people in Germany. So a lot of people in Germany uh, should not be attracted to come to Croatia, come here, we can solve your problem, but just uh, let you know uh, these problems can be solved here, it's up to you. And uh, uh, surprisingly, this year in tourism, maybe you have uh, this data, uh, Croatia had a, a, a decrease of overall uh, tourists coming to Croatia, but uh, some special, special niches had an all-time high. For example, villas with pool, uh, family uh, boats, uh, catamarans, uh, they, they had a, a really a, a high level of demand. Uh, because it was this new normality. Give me something that is closed, uh, where I don't mix with other people, and I will enjoy my holidays, I will enjoy my staying, and I think we should just adjust a little bit, not change our behavior, not change our offerings, just adjust a little bit to the new uh, demand that is happening, and all the data is there. Google is providing, uh, Facebook is providing with a lot of data, a lot of researches that you can check, uh, people in a way postponed and in a way uh, changed a little bit their behavior, but they didn't change it completely. Uh, and that is the point of actually my presentation. And thank you for watching. If there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, if not, uh, it will be even, I will be even happier. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Varga. I'm, I'm sure there will be questions. But we have to be a bit patient uh, till that moment and uh, continue with the next presentation. We are still um, within the scheduled time and uh, we uh, are thankful, Mr. Varga, to have a very informative and very useful, I believe, uh, presentation on, uh, um, uh, on um, possible promotion uh, platforms and, and tools that we may use even in these times. And the next presentation comes from uh, 
a topic of branding and marketing in the age of COVID-19 and will be provided by Mr. Ilan Geva, medical travel expert, influencer and opinion leader. Hello everybody, I am uh, Ilan Geva. This is the, I believe the third time that I'm participating in this conference, which I really like. And I'm sorry that I cannot be physically in Croatia, in Shrikvenica, and share good times and opinions and ideas with all my friends and colleagues. But it is what it is, and we have to continue under the circumstances. So I'm going to talk to you today about branding and marketing in the age of COVID, which is a very strange age. I have some thoughts, I have some recommendations, but I want you to understand that first of all, I only have 15 minutes. And the second thing is that uh, my ideas and my thoughts are not necessarily the rule. So you can get inspired by them and think about them, but they are not absolutely the solution. There are many other ideas and many other thoughts. So please listen to all of them and make sure that you do what you do best for yourself. Now, look at us now. This is really not a normal situation. And because this is not a normal situation, we already have something that many of us have never experienced before. Many of us simply do not know what to do with this. And there are some situations in the market that require change. So the first question that I'm asking is this, is marketing different today than it was only one year ago? And my answer is definitely yes. Number one, there is a lot of fear. Consumers as well as providers are not as open to all the offers as before and preferences of consumers have changed dramatically. The changes in the market conditions, the affordability, the access, the choices, just the fact that we cannot travel from one place to another limits us tremendously. And because of that, our choices are limited as well. We also started to realize that because of the situation, many people are over promising, but they're actually under delivering. So I don't know how it is in Europe, but we start hearing about cases where many marketers are promising all their missing customers things that they actually cannot deliver. And that's really not good. So you have to be careful about what are the promises that you get and what are the delivery methods. At the same time, consumer expectations are rising. And I can tell you that I'm witnessing some interesting things with telemedicine. Telemedicine has an amazing future. Nobody has a doubt. But we have to be very careful with how we market telemedicine because I'm watching some trends that medicine is the solution for everything. And we know that telemedicine is not the solution for everything. It is limited. It's not for everybody, and yet it sounds like people are promoting it as the solution for all medical tourism problems. And at the end, here is a simple thing. We have overload of messaging on all the platforms. Some of the platforms are actually collapsing because there is too much pressure. So before you begin marketing, I want you to be honest with yourself. Are you still thinking in pre-COVID terms? Meaning, are you still running your business the same way? Did you change anything in your actual business model? Because you may have to look at your business model and start from there. You may have to make some very painful decisions about what to do with your business going into the future. Are you offering what consumers really need and really want? Or are you just offering what you have to offer without paying attention? Are you really better than your competition? Now, we know that in the medical business, it is almost not allowed to say, I am better than the other doctor, because you cannot really prove it. 
So I'm talking about your service. Is your service really better than the services of your competition? Check it. Be honest with yourself. Make sure that whatever you promise can be delivered. Above all, I want you to think strategically and not tactically. And many people are making the mistakes by thinking that if they add services, meaning tactical, that will be the right way to go forward. If they buy new equipment, that'll be the right way forward. But that's not a strategy. Think overall about the strategy of your business and then go down to the tactics. Will you, make, will you market yourself as a caregiver? This is a very important word today. We all need care. We all want the human touch. We are missing the care in the medical business. Can you say that you are a service that provides altruism, compassion, patience, empathy, not just technically superior to other businesses, but talk about the humanity in your business and see where you are when it comes to humanity. Will you market safety? Everybody's talking about safety. Everybody wants to be safe, feel safe, and everybody is thinking about safety, but how? Will you just talk about the fact that you have hand sanitizer in your clinic? I mean, really, is that enough? Plexiglass screens between employees and patients and that you keep safe distance? This is really not what I call safety. Or can you project more than just the sanitizers and create a brand that is based on safety. Safety can be defined many, many ways except for the simple safe elements in your office. Will you market innovation? Everybody's talking about innovation, but the question is, what are you going to market in that word innovation? Are your services, equipment, and staff creative, imaginative, non-linear, and non-conformative? Those are completely different concepts of innovation, and they don't necessarily mean, oh, I have the latest model of the Da Vinci machine. Are, how are you comparing those kind of traits that your staff has when you look at your competition? Is it something that you added because of COVID? Or is it really embedded in your brand, part of your brand soul, part of the essence of the brand that you can always present to people, not just because we are experiencing a very difficult time. Will you do webinars? Will you write blogs? Will you do what I'm doing now? Here I am talking, I don't know if it's hundreds of people or thousands of people, but I'm sitting in my office at home and I'm talking to the world and I'm giving a lot of time and thought to what I say, what I write, and what I send across the globe as a message. In short, can you become an authority in what you do? Someone that patients can trust and want to be with. Because that's a whole different concept of trusting somebody because you feel and you think that that somebody is an authority. They know what they say. They know what they do. And there's absolute trust between you and them. So think about the following. COVID took away a lot of humanity and empathy. We are all hiding behind the masks and we're all hiding behind our computers. Human touch had to be avoided at all costs. So what can you do about that? How will you overcome this very, very demanding situation where all humanity around us is craving the human touch, missing it, and there is very little we can do about it? How can you compensate for that? Fear is in control now. How do you address the amygdala, which is the 
the brain fear spot in your marketing material because the world is a very fragile environment right now. And with that in mind, we don't want to increase the level of fear that already exists out there. We want to soothe. We want to be, to, to show empathy. We want to embrace people even though we cannot touch them. Here's an interesting example. During the 2008 recession, Hyundai marketed their cars, at least in the US, with this kind of a commercial. Right now, buy any new Hyundai, and if in the next year you lose your income, we will let you return it. Wow, what a concept. So think of it as an inspiration for your post-COVID marketing. So here, here you have a car company, and we know that the minute you drive your car away from, from the um, dealership, the value of that car immediately goes down, and you cannot return it. There is no such thing. And here is a car company that says, no argument. If you're in financial distress, we will take your car back. No arguments, no questions. That's an amazing marketing approach. And by the way, right now, Ford in the U.S. is offering exactly the same thing. Uh, I don't know if the conditions are identical, but the idea of empathy is there. And that's a very good idea to consider. In addition to your fantastic healthcare services, what else do you provide? Think human, always, humanity. COVID-19 is causing a major behavioral change in our global society. Social media is actually increasing the global panic. Exercise calm in everything you do and everything you say. Make sure you pay attention to how you write things, how you present things, and just stay calm. Always remember, what might be a good solution for your marketing efforts is not necessarily a global formula. So you have to find you know, your own voice. Don't copy from others because what may work for somebody in a clinic in France may not work for a clinic in Italy or in Israel or in Croatia or in the US. These are all different markets. These are all different people. And by the way, day by day, the situation of the pandemic is just going up and down, up and down all over the world. And whenever you think that we got rid of it, it comes back. We are now having that experience in the US and it's very unsettling. We may survive the virus and we learned about uh, uh, digital solutions because that was the only way we could really do things. But as appealing as it might be, something is missing. We need it. It's the craving for the physical sense of belonging a desire for human connection at any price, everywhere. And that includes all the marketing materials. In addition, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I have a little problem here. Here it is. So reevaluate your business offering, your relationship with the world, and your priorities. You may have to change the priorities that you have currently in your business plan, in the way you offer things, the services you offer. Think about it again. Reevaluate the entire business. Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Can you do that? So far, the world around medical tourism is not showing much of change. Airlines are not just going broke, but still treat customers badly. Hotels basically reduce their services using the excuse of being clean and keeping you safe. Insurance companies are worse than ever, and most companies have reduced the level of customer service with one excuse or another. Should you be one of them? After all, customer service is marketing. So think about it that way. That will change the way you think about your business. Customer service is marketing. 
customer service is your brand, not necessarily the medical solution, but everything around the medical solution. In difficult times, your customers and patients will notice the difference that you make and will remember it for a very long time. So make a difference. Be different from others as well. Because again, this is marketing. This is branding. During the hardest times of the pandemic, all marketers said basically the same thing. We are with you. We think of you. We take care of you. We love you. That was typical corporate language that basically means nothing because they never said it before. Suddenly they love me. Suddenly they take care of me. Why didn't you take care of me before? We don't know. That means that that was empty language. Be real, be authentic, and above everything, don't tell stories and don't promise things that you cannot fulfill. It's up to you to find the real way to make a difference. Historically, we know that any marketer who neglected the authenticity of his brand was forgotten and eventually failed. The number one thing you should not do is just leave marketing and don't do anything about it, thinking that, oh, when COVID will go, people will remember me, they'll come back. No, you have to continue. You have to sustain the brand. You have to feed the brand all the time. I have noticed that in almost all the recent webinars about what to do after COVID, no one talks about working on the internal brand, not just the external, not just your website, but internally. I would recommend to all of you to start and think about auditing your brand. Make sure it is still relevant for your customers and most importantly, relevant for the times that we are living now. Those times are different. Finally, this is a very interesting chart and I've learned it from a futurist a person who specializes in forecasting the future and predicted what can happen a few years from now. And he said a very interesting thing. Anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become hugely valuable. Look at the list here. Emotions, creativity, imagination, ethics, empathy, consciousness, values, mystery, compassion, intuition, all these things cannot really be expressed by artificial intelligence or by computers. They can be expressed only by human beings. So continue to be human beings and with that humanity, market your business for the time after COVID-19. Thank you very much. I wish you all the best, lots of success, and I hope that all of us will get to see each other in person in the near future. Thank you. Thank uh, um, Mr. Ilan uh, Geva. We, that was the final presentation of our conference and then our second day and second block in the second day. And uh, what the, is remained is questions and answers for this set. Mr. Varga is here with us in the studio and we will be including him in the questions and answers. We have several other uh, participants in this slot online, including uh, Ms. Michaela Keder from Medical Tourism Manager of Visit Berlin, um, Ms. Uh, Salva Rafi, Vice President at H. Uh, ISEC, uh, Medical Travel Expert, Influencer and Opinion Leader, Mr. Ilan Geva, and um, a, a fresh new guest, Ms. Isabella Vertar, Editor-in-Chief of the Sensa Magazine here in Croatia. So now if we, if we may have a couple of just slides to present uh, the magazine and the projects of um, the Sensa magazine. So this is the magazine. There's a Sensa weekend project that lasts for several years, years now. Sensa yoga retreat, a newer one. And there's a Sensa day as a project. It's an open air vitality festival. So let's start with Isabella. Isabella, good day. Are you here with us today? Hello. Hi. Hope you hear me. Hi. Yes, Isabella. I'm as close to this as can be. I'm from Zagreb, so let's say the connection is good because of it. Great, great, Isabella. So basically, first of all, I need to congratulate to you 
um, on, an, um, on a project, um, a great event that was held yesterday also in Zagreb. I learned the Adria Luxury Summit, which is one of the projects that you're engaged in. And it is not di directly involved with the, the Sensa, uh, the magazine that you're editor-in-chief. But we had in previous presentations a statement that new luxury is health and wellness. So can you tell me more about the magazine and topics you cover, and can it be related to uh, new luxury trends, in a way? Uh, well, with the, the Adria Luxury uh, Society project, we have uh, uh, entered uh, a large segment that is still growing and will have a rep to grow in the years to come uh, in the whole region of Adriatic. So with yesterday's uh, conference, uh, the summit we had, it is the second one that we held in Zagreb, we opened uh, the question of the future of luxury and well-being, wellness and health certainly is uh, one of the growing uh, segments in, in luxury. Uh, being uh, the, the connection with Sensa and the other uh, luxury uh, society, uh, we are uh, regarding the same topics and we are uh, challenging uh, what is next, uh, what is uh, interesting, and most of all, what is the need of the consumer. And uh, we talked about patients already, but I would say people, uh, uh, especially in the prevention segment, and this is something that we have been uh, doing with Sensa magazine uh, for over 13 years now, and with all of our projects in this segment like Sensa Weekend, uh, Sensa Yoga Retreats, uh, the uh, specially uh, planned uh, uh, programs for people to have time for their own, uh, but not just uh, the leisure time, but time to uh, think about their health, to learn new ways of uh, uh, expressing it and living it. Uh, so the prevention and not just the care is in the uh, is one of the main pillars of the Sensa as a brand in whole, not just the magazine, but all the things that we do. So you're basically doing the product and as a as a media as a magazine, you're also um, a communication platform for advertisers for marketing of those services. So. Could you give a piece of advice to the advertisers, to our stakeholders, private or, or the public ones? Um, you know, what kind of marketing and, and, and publications or projects would be the most effective marketing and advertising tool at this point? Uh, a lot has been uh, said about um, the uh, trustworthy brands and about the stories that uh, uh, went to the public even before the pandemic. So uh, having a strong brand and practicing what you preach is very important for us in Sensa and we have made it uh, a stable brand and a brand uh, that uh, the people uh, look up to find it comforting and we have a really strong community. So I would say uh, this practice what you preach is one of the main things as the presenter before me already said in this presentation. Uh, what we can do uh, uh, vice versa for each other uh, us being uh, a magazine and a media and, uh, um, and our partners is to create uh, a, a unique story and uh, bring the topics that are important, especially now. I must say that the communication uh, coming from the states, uh, from the governments uh, regarding this pandemic, especially in Croatia, we say stay safe, uh, stay responsible. Unfortunately, most of the people uh, find it that someone is telling them to stay put. And I think there's a great need, uh, especially after the first six, seven months of the pandemic, is to go the other way around, to talk more about health, to talk more about prevention and uh, exact uh, points of how to do that. Uh, uh, and not just stay put in their houses, but to stay active in, uh, in, the, in the care uh, uh, given to themselves by themselves. Uh, Sensei is here to give uh, solutions. Uh, our, pro uh, our programs that are going live are here to uh, give people even more chance to find what is good for them, uh, health-wise, well-being-wise, and wellness-wise. And I think our partners in these prog pro uh, uh, programs, especially uh, the uh, the tourist uh, um, 
a tourist part of it. Uh, the hotels uh, that we are partnering with are uh, in this story uh, together with us to show uh, their strength and their brand and their communication of uh, of being a place safe uh, for the for the travelers and for the guests, but as, uh, especially a place where you can find uh, good solutions for health, wellness, and uh, well-being. Thank you, Isabella. Um, I'm certain that there will be more questions for you and for uh, all the participants very soon uh, via our event app. But in the meantime, I would like to stick to the uh, idea of marketing and advertising at these days. So, uh, Mr. Varga, you already told us a lot about uh, Google Analytics, uh, the data, and so on. But what is actually, in your opinion, in these actual pandemic days, what, does, what kind of marketing does make sense? especially for the health tourism. So it's health, so it's, it's a Googleable, and it is, it is still a Googled uh, term. But what kind of marketing do you think can make some um, results even at, at these times? Uh, thank you for your question. I think uh, that Mr. Uh, Elon Geva answered uh, uh, quite a portion of this question. Uh, we have to overcome the fears of the, of the possible uh, patients or visitors or, or um, clients, never mind. Uh, what what uh, I have shown in my presentation is that the interest is almost uh, untouchable. Actually, in some areas, it's even higher than it was ever before. So health problems uh, didn't uh, disappear with Corona. Corona just uh, put a nice uh, blanket over all the problems. But if you have a uh, uh, pain in the back, you have still the pain in the back and uh, it has not been solved with Corona. What I think should be done in marketing, uh, it should be this uh, uh, new process of uh, fear of losing everything. Uh, it was a nice example with the cars, but uh, uh, in, in the United States where, where you can give the car back, a lot of uh, airplane companies have introduced this new possibility of uh, money-back guarantee uh, 24 hours before your flight. A lot of hotels have introduced this. I think just uh, that we have to adjust, that we have to include and, and, and embrace this new full uh, uh, fear of losing everything, uh, uh, behavior in our marketing and advertising strategies. Uh, so on one side, we should uh, try to overcome people's fear. On the other side, we should guarantee to them that uh, uh, they will not lose anything if they have uh, uh, decided to do any business with us. And uh, actually uh, watching uh, and, and analyzing the numbers, people are adjusting to this new situation and are uh, searching and, and uh, uh, searching for answers about health problems almost as it was before this corona uh, uh, times. So I think uh, uh, we should adjust, but should not change radically. We should uh, think about the fears. We should think about the uh, uh, fear of losing, fear of, uh, uh, um, fear of, uh, in a way, uh, what will happen to me if Corona is uh, uh, entering my life. But uh, safety and, and security and Medical problems are still uh, still just here and need to be a little bit adjustment um, adjust, uh, adjusted. Um, it was very nice the last slide where where uh, I saw this uh, uh, human behavior, empathy, uh, fear, uh, love, and whatever. Uh, everything connected with emotions is still here. It it didn't disappear. And I think we should as a, as a people offering anything in this area of, of business, we should uh, try to explain people uh, that would come to us that fear is uh, um, something that, we, uh, that uh, we can overcome, that we have solved all the problems that are, and it's, it, it's not just putting a dispenser, uh, you, uh, explaining to people, nothing will happen, adjust your marketing strategies and change your uh, not change, add some additional messages to a marketing strategy, and I think that should be the new, the new approach to marketing in health tourism. Thank you, Mr. Varga. So basically, uh, that, that's in line with Mr. Mr. Uh, Geva's presentation, but I would like to 
uh, hear from him a bit more specific, and it is related to just uh, Mr. Varga said a second ago. So maybe we should stop being focused on the COVID itself, because it's a crisis, it's actual, and it is here to stay. It will have several peaks, obviously. But uh, Mr. Geva, could we, despite uh, all the negativity around us, uh, could we perhaps get with some positive ideas um, along and, and opportunities that come along with COVID in our communications and use it uh, in a way for marketing our services? Positive ideas are fertile when you have a receiving audience that is waiting to hear some positive ideas and optimism. Now, the difference is between, let's say, the United States and Europe. The United States has suffered, when we're talking about marketing in the age of COVID, it is very difficult to be optimistic and positive in a country that has been governed by a completely impotent government that didn't do anything for 330 million citizens. And we now have, we are very close to 250,000 deaths in the United States alone. And the news are coming again and again and again every day and it's going worse and worse and worse it is very difficult under such leadership to be positive because it will look a little out of touch in other countries where the politicians the governments the leaders real leaders when they do things that show the audiences out there show the market that they are indeed planning something to improve the situation, in those places you have place for optimism. And then you have an open ground for creative ideas to express the optimism and show the positive side of things. Uh, so I think that it differs really. And I, on purpose, I gave you this very stark difference between the situation in the US versus let's say the situation in Denmark. So there is no one formula that fits the whole world in terms of being positive and optimistic. Thank you very much. Um, regarding um, the, the, the circumstances, um, we have uh, heard uh, Michaela's uh, presentation on the case of Berlin. And with this optimism uh, that it is required with the marketing activities, uh, what would you say is or was so far um, the key to Berlin's success in medical as a medical destination? And what do you think uh, will help you strive as one these days or uh, let's say post COVID crisis? I mean, I think one reason for Berlin's uh, success is that definitely we have the capital region, which is Berlin and the surrounding area where we have many medical providers, uh, internationally established, um, most uh, modern um, treatments available and so on, um, working together. So uh, we have uh, centers for diagnostics. Uh, they delegate the patients to the to the hospitals. They delegate the patients to the rehabilitation centers. So it's not about uh, competition, I would say. But the Berlin act, uh, actors here, they quite well learned the lesson that um, together we are strong. And this gives our also um, appearance to, to the outside, to the in, on the international uh, um, Floor, uh, a very good kind of reputation. So that's one. Um, and I think, I mean, the, the question is how can we market nowadays in this uh, Corona era? Um, I mean, maybe I can give you some, some details about Visit Berlin in general as a city destination. Um, of course, right now it's difficult to convey the message to come to a, Berlin, uh, to a city like Berlin. People imagine crowded spaces, uh, downtown area with many people. Uh, so what Visit Berlin as a destination marketing organization was doing 
is to focus on the green side. I mean, there are many parks, there are many more bridges than even in Venice. There are many lakes and recreational areas. So this was, uh, at least at the beginning, uh, what Visit Berlin was marketing uh, nationally and on the European level. We developed a claim, which is uh, Berlin This Too, which shows Berlin from its natural side. Um, and um, in regards to marketing Berlin right now as a medical destination, I would say um, we are, as I, as I already uh, indicated, we, are, we put our marketing activities on hold. I mean, the travel industry in, ge in general right now is trying to promote or is following an idea which you can say dream now, travel later. So there are lots of images spread out. Um, sometimes so much displays that you see um, an outdoor uh, marketing display. For example, I saw it just recently for Barcelona here in Berlin and Barcelona is in, under a total lockdown. So this is a typical example of having uh, how, of how messages can, can be displaced in, in the times of Corona. So you should be cautious and we are cautious. Um, what we do definitely is, as I mentioned also, I mean, we try to keep up the accessibility. Maybe I don't uh, say um, if you transfer the dream now, travel later, then diagnose now and travel later, at least if, if, it's, if it's possible in, on, on, from the health perspective of the, of the patient. And um, in all those your efforts, um, uh, um, Michaela, do, and, and whatever you're working at this point, are you working with some kind of um, um, facilitators or some agencies that are bringing uh, international patients to Berlin or even national ones? Or is, is, is every stakeholder working on, on, on his own? And are the clients coming more you know, via through, through operators or foreign institutions or insurances or are the majority of them individual? And how has it changed now in COVID times? Mm -hmm. So we, we do not cooperate with facilitators, especially there are not very uh, established ones here in Berlin. But we, are, we actually do rely on the uh, services which the hospitals already offer. So they establish the international offices. There is uh, multilingual staff uh, who supports the patients in arranging uh, accommodation, in getting the medical visa in his or her home country. So it's actually a service which the hospitals here in Berlin already established, which goes far beyond the typical uh, medical service, which is usually offered for the German patients. So uh, what I just want to say is that um, it, they basically uh, support the service which a classical maybe facilitator is, is offering. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so there is still communications even in Berlin, and there is a suggestion that Michaela provided, for example, so dream now, uh, travel later. Uh, Mr. Varga explained how um, there were, there are still, there is still demand, there is still uh, inquiries um, on the topics and the services that we were talking about. But um, that also, at, at, especially at these uh, days and. Uh, at these times of crisis when we require transparency, when we are looking for credential information, um, reliable one, uh, it's, it's the question also of, I think, the, 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 the safe transfer of the information and, uh, and the data. So uh, for uh, Ms. Rafi, for, for, for Salva Rafi, uh, would be the question, and uh, uh, how safe is uh, at this point uh, uh, communication in in um, in hospital networks or in facilities networks. How often do you uh, notice or you, do you measure um, security breaches or attacks uh, happen? Um, so uh, <clears throat> you know the security and the privacy of patient data is the uh, our our focus here. Um, when we talk about you know I, I come from a health uh, healthcare security agency. Uh, HIZAC, and we see that with the traveling patients, you know, they are part of the e EMR system in the hospital, but because they are traveling, uh, because of the uh, uh, their sensitive data would be going from one country to the other, uh, hopefully for the continuity of care, this is a big challenge and, and a big vulnerability, frankly, when it comes to cybersecurity. 
um, hospitals have been hacked uh, repeatedly. Uh, they are the most vulnerable uh, part in the healthcare system. And we have uh, seen or witnessed the imminent threat um, that was issued last week just about the vulnerabilities and the ransomware targeting many hospital systems. Um, so this will continue to be a big issue for us and something that we need to strive to work on, um, especially when uh, patients either come through with their medical data, with their diagnosis, they are seeking the treatment and then getting all of this uh, data back to their own countries. So transportation interoperability has always been a problem and not just among countries. It's uh, We see it simply among different healthcare facilities, uh, moving it from the family physician to the tertiary care hospital, as an example, uh, still uh, IT and interoperability issues exist. Um, so this is a big uh, challenge, which uh, hospitals and you know facilitators sometimes also have access to this data, which is a big loophole in the regulations. We need to be very cognizant uh, of this problem. Uh, the other day here in Croatia news, um, 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 we have noticed uh, that in a, a neighboring country, there have been uh, photos and videos of a naked woman in an, um, an improvised um, COVID hospital that were um, filmed and set online. So this is one of the bad examples, uh, of course, in, in these extraordinary uh, circumstances. But Ms. Rafi, is there a safe way to transfer patients' data uh, these days, especially if you're talking about um, a telemedicine? So if, if there is a, a link, it, it includes video, it includes communications, mm -hmm. servers, platforms, uh, providers, and so on. So there are many people and many uh, technology chains in that communication transfer process. So is there um, perhaps a certificate that we may rely on that, you know, that process has been certified and assured that it is in a way safe and, 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 and proof of um, mm -hmm. um, security breaches? Well, there is no universal, uh, there is no simple answer, unfortunately, for the security of the data. So we see in telemedicine or telehealth networks, we need to make sure that everything is authenticated, you know, device security. We are using lots of medical devices uh, sometimes within the telehealth system uh, to measure uh, and, uh, vital signs or to take medical imaging um, and the transmission uh, as well. Uh, between the data. Uh, perhaps the, the best thing that we could do is uh, have um, a hospital to a hospital or practitioners uh, using their own systems to transmit the data uh, just as much as possible to minimize the exposures to the facilitators, to the uh, all the handlers of the data <clears throat> if the patient is traveling for medical tourism. Um, I expect this hopefully to return back as a physical travel sometime maybe in the end of next year after um, vaccination is available and we, we are more relaxed with the travel and the boundaries and the borders are opened. Uh, but so far, telehealth has proven to be um, when it comes from certified sources and, and, and hospitals, they have been um, you know, as safe as possible. There is nothing called 100% secure, unfortunately. Uh, so just try to not to minimize and expose the data to many resources and uh, also targeting um, uh, secure uh, hospitals who will make sure that, you know, users are authenticated and not just uh, for security, but also for the privacy. Only users who are authorized to see the patient data should be able to do that uh, at the right time. So we, we need to be very, very strict when uh, who... Uh, handles and sees the patient data. Thank you. Thank you very much. In the meantime, we have received several questions uh, through the event app. Um, so let's uh, see the first one uh, at this point and uh, share the information with the broader audience. So the question uh, we have received is from uh, Parikshit Yahurka, and it's for Mr. Ilan Geva. Mr. Geva, what do you think Americans, will they travel more for medical treatments when the pandemic starts to abate owing to growing healthcare costs and increasing insurance premiums in the United States? Uh, yeah, the $1 million question. So what happens in the U.S. is that we are in a situation that we just 
went through an election and the previous uh, and of course some people say that the process is not has not been decided yet but we know for a fact one thing if let's say trump will succeed to stay in power they are going to fight tooth and nail to remove the healthcare plan that obama installed which means that a lot of people will lose their health insurance in the united states that can trigger a mass exodus of americans specifically to neighboring countries mexico south america central america and they will seek treatments that they can obtain for much less cost than they would in the united states if biden will become the president and the chances are that he indeed will become the president the whole attitude to the healthcare system in the united states may change which means that many people will retain their current health insurance and maybe millions more people will join the network of insured people in the united states and that could create a situation where in the US and everybody thinks of the US as one big market but it's not one market it is 50 different markets with 50 different states that are regulated by completely different rules and regulations so we can see a lot of medical tourism movement inside the US not outside the US but there is already some examples where people are traveling from one state to another and are getting excellent medical treatment for 50% of the price that they can get it in their own state. So it's a very big question. We don't have an exact answer. It's connected to consumer behavior. It's connected to market condition and market offerings. But I anticipate that with the Biden administration, things will actually improve inside the United States and less Americans will travel overseas to seek medical treatments, specifically Asia and maybe even Europe, long distances. And they will seek those solutions either for a cheaper price or better quality in other destinations inside the United States. Thank you, Mr. Geva. Uh, I do hope that we haven't interrupted the beauty sleep of our speakers calling us from the United States because it's still pretty much early back home. But we have more questions, so I do please uh, uh, ask you to stay, uh, stand by, although we are uh, very close to the very end of the schedule, finish of the conference, but we have received many questions and we would like to follow through a couple of more. So let's go to the next question for our panelists. It's for Mr. Varga. You mentioned the consumer survey where you can ask one question for little money. Can you please expand? So can you please uh, elaborate a bit? Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's very easy actually to use. It's just Google uh, consumer survey. And then you will get uh, the platform for asking questions with yes or no answers or with optional answers. Uh, it's uh, pretty much self-explanatory, so uh, you will not have any problems. Just Google, uh, Google Consumer Survey, go to the Google uh, Survey interface, and then you can start to ask people questions for, uh, I think it's uh, 10, 10 uh, euro cents uh, is each answer. Uh, um, you can uh, ask them questions about any anything you want, but you cannot mention any brands or offerings. So you cannot, for example, uh, ask a question: Did you know that the new Hyundai is 20% cheaper than it was? It's it's not an allowed question, but you can ask them uh, geographically or some other uh, questions with a yes and no answering. Um, uh, system, it's, it's very easy. You, you will find all the explanations in the interface. Thank you, Mr. Vaga. We have another question that we will allow in this set. So it's for Ms. Salva Rafi. Please, 
don't scare me, tell me what I can or should do. Well, that's really an upfront question. So <laughs> let's get a free advice. Um, from a patient's perspective, uh, you know, we, um, if we are the patient, um, like I, I definitely agree with Ilan that uh, uh, travel would start um, as soon as bo the, the borders are open. And um, uh, we here in the U.S., we have very expensive procedures compared to other countries because of many reasons, because of the um, uh, insurance uh, uh, companies, multiple uh, insurance companies. The advice would be um, to really just be very careful with the data. Uh, use only authenticated devices. Uh, uh, make sure that users who access your data as a patient are authorized to do that. And, um, and um, uh, for, from a hospital perspective, we as medical practitioners, we also need to pay much more attention to cybersecurity. Um, you know, ransomware has never been um, uh, and the attacks have never been higher uh, than this year. Um, I mentioned in my presentation that we have seen quadruple uh, increase in the number of cyber attacks on the healthcare system uh, just because of the COVID situation, because we know the hackers know that uh, the, the facilities are engaged in uh, and overwhelmed really uh, with the treatment. So. All hospitals need to uh, make sure that they have the talent. Uh, frankly, I would say um, need to make sure that they have the security staff, need to be updated with the threat intelligence that organizations such as HISAC would be sending uh, to all the hospitals and need to be proactive. Um, uh, we have a medical device special committee that would talk about the vulnerabilities of the medical devices um, and, uh, you know, whether it's an electronic medical record, med device, uh, or a telemedicine, telehealth network, uh, this is an ongoing process. There is no magic way. It's an ongoing process to stay uh, proactive ahead of the curve and how to get back to resiliency. Um, so hospitals are really asked and invited to be resilient, uh, strive for that and to get that back to business as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, uh, Ravi. Uh, we have come to the actual end of uh, today's set of the Tsekvenitz International Health Tourism Conference. And um, um, I, I feel like really the time has flied and I had a great time. I enjoyed the uh, networking opportunity to talk uh, to so many prominent speakers and uh, panelists. Um, and not to disappoint you, you will all have the opportunity to continue communicating and networking through our event app uh, on Tsekvenitz International Health Tourism Conference and both uh, the website uh, ciht.com.hr. So please stand by, stand online, let's uh, meet up uh, digital. Uh, the conference has come to its end and we have uh, presented all our content. I, I would like to thank once again all the panelists and all the speakers that have uh, joined us in this last session, but all the rest uh, equally that have participated in the conference. It, 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 it's, it, it has been so much uh, that I have learned. It, it, was, it was so many information that we have shared, but I kind of got an, um, an, an, an uh, uh, impression that we can conclude uh, perhaps four most uh, important uh, uh, highlights um, of the conference. For, first of all, that I have to get uh, to start locally. Croatia really had um, <clears throat> um, a successful summer season that most probably did um, mean uh, success for uh, health tourism participants and stakeholders, which was very important. And at this point, we have experience even in the new normal, uh, if we call it so, that the season 2021 in Croatia will come again. Um, our geolocation, our um, uh, seasonality, sometimes disadvantage. In this case, it was an advantage. The governmental and, and the national response uh, in, in spring was um, uh, really extraordinary. And that was one of the reasons we had the, the tourism season in the first place. Also, the service is ready. Croatian health providers, private and public, are ready for development uh, of the COVID times or post-COVID times of the health uh, tourism uh, perspectives. And especially for the private stakeholders, 
who can and can and should be uh, the most agile and resilient ones. That's the, the idea of the free market in the first place. Do prepare, because as uh, Ms. Lazzo said, you know, the crisis will happen this way or the other at this moment or the next, but if we don't have a plan, if we don't have standard operational procedures, if we don't have a vision and a mission in place set before the crisis comes, it will be very, very difficult to respond to it. Secondly, I like what Mr. Jikic said also, and uh, many people uh, in a way um, uh, confirmed that, especially Mr. Geva now comparing with administration of another country, transparency and proactivity of public shareholders, both in handling the crisis, communicating the crisis, providing the guidelines and uh, the, the work frame for all of us is of utmost importance, but also uh, to support the businesses in these challenging times, especially the ones with the topic and perspective like health tourism, I think for all of us is a must. Uh, finally, many of us have been talking about the optimism, the uh, sustainability of our marketing uh, activities at these times and adopting with the messages that, that should not be leg uh, neglected. Uh, not because of the COVID, but in spite of the COVID and especially in the way that can provide a resilience to all of the uh, critical circumstances of our living these days, and that was prevention. So wellness and sports and healthy living, food, these are all topics that we can promote through our business models and practices and in public uh, activities just as well. And the one that I find very interesting these days because I'm finding utmost challenges is that the emotions and emotion of fear, which is resilient to the artificial intelligence as all emotions are, is the one that will be the overwhelming for the next days, weeks, and months to come. And once that we are aware and we own the issue and uh, our state of mind and state of our souls, perhaps, I think it's uh, the thing that we should face and adopt because we cannot change the environment. We cannot change the crisis, but we can change ourselves. We can adapt with our state of mind with optimism, with positive perspective towards ourselves, environment, people around us, and whatever the business or our ideological framework may be. Because in the end, it is all up to us and our perspectives. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So I do invite you, you know, to go into the past in your previous experiences. Three years ago, we had a conference like it. We were promoting and talking about the space travel and space tourism. And we used a hologram to uh, make the conference available and accessible to a wider audience of, uh, of, of attendees. These days, we are going virtual. So I think that we all learn and the lifelong learning is the pattern and uh, the model that we should all embrace to embrace for impact, whatever it brings and take the best out of it. Once again, I would like to, on behalf of the organizers, the Kvenica Tourist Board and the Kvarner Health Tourism Clusters, and as well the co-organizers, Talasotherapia Cirkvenica and the Polyclinic Terme Selce, thank you for participating in the conference. I believe you have enjoyed it. I was honored and privileged to be your host. It was a tremendous experience for me just as well. I would also like to thank all the sponsors and partners and among all, I would really like to thank Jadran Cikvenica, the, whole con ho the hotel, co hotel company from Cikvenica that was our host for so many years. And I'm really looking forward to inviting you all to Cikvenica next year for the ninth Cikvenica International Health Tourism Conference to Kvarner Bay, to Cikvenica, where you can experience all the riches and all the benefits and all the perspectives that we have been talking so much about that Kvarner Bay Croatia and Sekvenica has to offer. Stay well and till the next year, see you in Sekvenica. Bye-bye.